All right, so imagine that I have this Express app that runs on production. There's a simple get endpoint that's responsible to fetch a user. This could be anything. I've simulated some delay here to make it more real world. And now what I'll do is I'll run this by typing in node index and go to localhost 3000 slash user. You see that we get the response after one second. But to actually benchmark this better, let's do some load testing on it. So there's this tool called AutoCannon that lets you benchmark your APIs. So I'll use that. I've already installed it globally in my system. But if you want to do it, you can simply just do npm install hyphen g and AutoCannon. So I already have it. I'll simply just run it. This will basically load test our app for 10 seconds and then later give us some metrics. So you'll see that by default, AutoCannon spins up 10 connections, which essentially means there were 10 sources that made multiple requests to this API. On average, each request took about one second to be resolved. If you see here on average, almost nine requests were being resolved. And in total, you see that 100 requests were resolved in this 10 second time frame. That's actually pretty bad, to be honest. For reference, if I just remove this set timeout and now run the same benchmarking, I'll have to refresh this app. Now, if I run AutoCannon again, you'll see a big difference this time. The results this time are much better. The average latency is almost six milliseconds, which compared to the previous test, you see that it's one second because we had that delay and in total almost 16,000 requests were made to this API endpoint on average almost 1600 requests were made per second. So this delay actually significantly impacted the performance for this API endpoint. But even with the delay, there are a few ways we can make our app perform better. So I bought this back. And we'll try to improve this by adding a few optimizations on top of this example. So let's go through it one by one. So normally a lot of APIs out there need not go to the database, make a fresh query and give you the result back all the time. Sometimes the data doesn't really update as frequently as you would think. So it's fine if you skip the database querying part and return an older response, which essentially means caching. So let's add that to our API. I'll use Redis to achieve that. So Redis runs entirely on memory. That's why it's super fast. Redis will actually help us with two problems. The first one is caching, as I mentioned earlier. And the second one is rate limiting. So rate limiting would help us with preventing abusive usage of our APIs by blocking a user from making more than a set amount of requests. I don't want a user to completely block my service by making millions of requests. So rate limiting is going to help us with that problem. Now, unfortunately, I'm using Windows and Redis, Redis doesn't natively run on Windows, but there's an easy workaround. Windows lets you run Linux based operating systems using WSL, which stands for Windows subsystem for Linux. We'll do that instead. Actually, I've already done it, but it's pretty straightforward to set it up on your system. So I'm on Microsoft's official documentation for WSL. And on this section, the install WSL section, if you see here, it asks you to run this command on PowerShell with administrator privileges. Once you run this, it will take a few minutes to install and set it up on your system. You'll have to restart your system once it's installed. After that, you need to install a Linux distribution. Ubuntu is the most popular one. So I went with that. You can simply go to the Microsoft store and search for Ubuntu here and install any of these versions. I have installed 24.04. You can install any of these LTS versions. And that's pretty much it. Now, just like you would run Redis on an actual Ubuntu system, you can do the same for Windows. In case of a Mac though, you can install Redis using Homebrew. It's again pretty straightforward. Now you open up Ubuntu and type in this command to install the Redis server. And then you can use this command to actually start the Redis server. I've already installed it, so I'm not going to do that. But let's actually start our Redis server. So let me open up Ubuntu. I've also installed 22.04 and not 24.04. 
this is a stable version but you can go forward with the latest one as well it has an lts version so i don't think it should give you any problems let's actually start our redis server again you have to first install redis server i've already done it so i'll directly start it it will ask me for my password and now if i want to check whether my service is up and running i can simply go and run status command you can see that it's running so our redis server is now up and running now let's go back to our code now inside here we'll need to install three libraries that will help us with caching and rate limiting using redis so it's gonna be these three libraries express rate limit rate limit redis and just redis i already installed all three of these in my project you can see here that is already there so i don't need to install it but go forward and install it in your project once that is done we'll import these libraries and set up the redis client so i've imported redis store create client and rate limit from these packages and i have set up the redis client after this we'll first add the rate limiting middleware this middleware ensures no ip can spam the api for more than 5 times in a minute so the time frame that i have set is for a minute and max number of requests in that time frame is just 5 If it goes beyond that limit, then you will see this message. You actually get a 429 status code error along with this message. Redis handles this efficiently even across multiple servers. So if I restart my server, let me save this first. I'll open up the terminal and over here let me restart my server. I'll go back to the browser and let's try to make the request 5 times. So this is the first request. I'll reload it again. I'll do this three more times. This is the last request. After this, ideally, I should be getting that error. Okay, maybe this was the last one. Yeah. Now you see the same error message that we had configured inside our Redis store. This is the exact same message. So our rate limiting works as expected. Now let's add caching to our example. I'll have to tweak our API a little bit to implement caching. So let me do that. So let me explain what I'm doing here. I'm using a cache key against which I'll check in my Redis store if there's an entry available. So Redis is essentially a key value pair system wherein for each key there's going to be some data stored. This is the cache key that I've created for this user endpoint. Actually this has to be dynamic because since this user endpoint deals with different types of users this should be created every time a request is made but since our example only deals with one user meaning we only have one user in the database we are setting it to user 1 so against this entry we will first check with the help of redis client and see if there's an entry already available with this key if that is the case we'll go inside this block we'll first console log the message saying that we are returning the cached entry and not the actual entry from the database we are then going to set this header i'll come to that in a minute and then we are returning the response with the cached entry we are not actually making a db query and then returning that result to the user we are returning the cached response from the redis store the reason why this is fast is because redis runs in memory and it's not running on a separate database so the fetch operation is pretty quick now what happens if the request is triggered for the first time if that is the case we won't be getting anything inside this operation it will try to find something against this cache key in the redis store but it won't get anything back so this if block won't be triggered everything else apart from that if block is going to be executed so it's first actually going to make a request to the database then it's going to set the data the result from the query inside the redis store against this cache key for 60 seconds so it will be stored inside the redis store for 60 seconds it will be cached for 60 seconds and then we set the same response header and we send back the data to the user after this any request that's made inside this 60 second time frame it's going to actually get the result from the redis store because it's already there it's already cached in the store and it's going to then go inside the if block and return the cached entry and not make a request to the database 
So now, what exactly is this header? So along with Redis caching, we have also added this HTTP header that enables caching on the browser. But unfortunately, it's a little finicky. So even if you do attach this header, it still checks the backend and will send you a 304 status response saying that nothing's modified. So let me actually show you that. I'll restart my server. Okay, I'll go back to the browser. Let me open up the network tab. Let me zoom in a little bit and I'll make a request to this endpoint. You see that we made a request and we got the 200 status, meaning everything works as expected. We get the response back. Now I'll make the request again. And this time it says 304 and not 200. If I click on this and go to headers, it says not modified, meaning it actually did make a request. On the backend, it did check that the, the data did not really change. So it gave you back this status and not 200. So this is not exactly browser level caching. The reason why I'm saying that it's not proper caching is because a request was still made to the backend. If it's properly cached on the browser, then ideally a request should not even be triggered. That's the problem. Browser level caching has a lot of caveats. If I have one misconfigured header like vary, for instance, it can kill browser caching altogether. There's also this concept of an E tag. In the case of an express app, E tags are created by default. So you can see here that we have an E tag in our response headers. This also is supposed to be disabled in order to achieve proper caching. Modern browsers to not show stale or incorrect content are very cautious about caching. So just to be safe, they'll almost always make a request to fetch again. Caching via CDNs makes more sense than this and for API Redis or in-memory caching will solve most of your problems. Now if you have watched my previous video, we talked about concurrency in Node.js and how it's not really single threaded because it uses libuv behind the scenes. Now by default, Node.js apps use only one CPU core, which is a waste of modern multi-core systems. Clustering lets you spawn multiple processes to share the load all listening on the same port. So there's a primary process that opens the port and distributes incoming connections or incoming requests to the workers using the operating system. Each worker independently runs the express app, but the port is managed by the primary process. So I'm going to make some changes to our code base now to implement clustering. This also is a performance optimization strategy wherein you have multiple workers to handle requests coming in from different connections. So let me change my code base and I'll explain to you what I've done. So the previous code that we saw, all of it is inside this else block. If you see here from top to bottom, everything is the same as we had in the last example. But there's also this if block now. This if block just checks if the process is a primary process. If that is the case, then based on the number of CPU cores in the system, this primary process will fork that many workers. So if you have a 16 core CPU system, it will fork 16 cores. The code inside the else block, that's ran inside these workers. So individual workers will handle the requests coming in and the else block content is what's being run by these workers. The primary process is just there to monitor and respawn any workers that crash. So you see here that on exit, on this exit event, the worker has essentially died or crashed for whatever reason. So it's going to essentially recreate a new worker. Now, if I load test this with AutoCannon, let's see what happens. So let me restart the server and let's load test it. You see here that it was now able to dissolve 45,000 requests. Okay, I accidentally removed the set timeout from this fake TB call. That's the reason why we are getting this as the max time. That should not be the case. Let me add the set timeout back so that we can simulate the delay. All right, it's back here. Let me restart the server. And you see here that when I start the server, there are so many workers that are being spawned and these are now ready to accept requests coming from different connections and resolve them. 
So this is like concurrency or multitasking and we don't really have to use only one core to handle all the requests coming in. Let's again load test this. Now we can see here that 41,000 requests were resolved of which the max time it took for any request in this 41,000 request was one second, almost one second. This most likely is the first one that was not cached. So the first request would take time to resolve. And after that, we just return the cache response. So on average, the request resolution time was almost two milliseconds. Most of the requests here were resolved in under six milliseconds. So, so this max timing was just for a couple of requests probably. You'll see here that almost 5,000 requests were executed per second. And there's one more thing if you've noticed over here, this statement. It says that only five out of the 41,000 requests were 2xx responses and the remaining were non-2xx responses. So when it says 2xx responses, it could be status code 200, 201. All of these are status codes for successfully resolved APIs. And there were only five of them. Remaining ones were non-200. So I believe that's because most of them got rate limited. After five requests, if you remember, we used to get 429. So this is probably happening because of that. So what I'll do is I'll simply disable the rate limiting for now and again run our application. This time we should not get this message because after the five requests, since it was being rate limited, all of them were non 200. Mostly most of them were just 429, but the result would still be somewhat similar because we are still caching our responses. So it will still take almost the same amount of time as you see here. Hopefully fingers crossed. Let's run this test again. All right. We do actually get a similar result. We don't see that message this time. The average time again is one and a half millisecond, which is great. Obviously this happened because of caching. The first request did take like one second to resolve, but after that, because of cached responses, 99% of the requests were resolved under four milliseconds and the average was 1.54 milliseconds. Almost 5,000 requests were being resolved per second. So if we compare our results with the original implementation, the original API was single threaded, had no caching. It was obviously slower. With Redis, we made it faster by caching in our responses, which reduced backend load. With clustering, we added a massive boost in concurrency. So there were multiple workers to resolve your request simultaneously. So now our API is a little closer to being production grade. There's obviously more to it and maybe I'll cover additional steps in later videos, but this does lay some groundwork in making your apps more robust. So yeah, if you have any suggestions around this or any other topic, do put them in the comments and I'll do my best to make a video around it. That's pretty much it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.